All right. We'll give everyone. Oh, that's very. That's very <laughs> we'll give everyone an, an opportunity to show up here. It's a it's a Tuesday evening, so things are a little light, and we don't have anyone tuned in just yet. Okay. But we'll uh, we'll give it here a second. I'm sure everyone is. There we go. We've got a few people tuning in right now. Welcome, everyone, to another exciting virtual experience slash tour with Pretty Gritty Tours. We are joined this evening by, of course, uh, Julia with the Foss Waterway Seaport, whose face you should be familiar with at this point. And, of course, <laughs> Bob, do you want me to introduce you as Master Diver, Treasure Hunter, Marine Explorer? What's your preferred title? Uh, just Rubber Master Diver. That's fine. We'll start off with that. We call um, him Dirk Pitt. <laughs> I've been I called like by a lot of things, quite frankly. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, it's really a pleasure to be with you and your program. It's a wonderful program, and I'm happy to help uh, any way I can with the Seaport Museum and their facilities so. and uh, the pretty, gritty tours as well. It's been a wonderful experience. Well, I so, appreciate you. I appreciate you joining us tonight. Great. So for those who are just tuning in right now, hopefully you've had an opportunity to go and see the documentary, Gertie Gallops Again. And um, Robert, would you like to just fill people in briefly on what your role is in that documentary? Yeah, back in uh, the 1990s, I was heavy in understanding Admiralty law, looking at shipwrecks, uh, submerged historical and non-historical aircraft to recover for museums, collectors, and uh, I spent a lot of time in Washington State drafting state laws for submerged resources, those being shipwrecks and aircraft. And in 1990, the end of the year, when we passed legislation in Washington State, I got a call from Municipal TV and Nancy Johnson, been following my antics those times uh, about historical preservation in the water, and uh, wanted to know if I had any ideas for something. And I said, the Tacoma Narrows is probably one of the most well-known events that happened. It's documented so well, and we've been fortunate enough to make many, many trips out there. To date, uh, I think we've probably logged over 500 dives. That's uh, starting in 1974, 75. So it's about 35 years. So I was talking to Bob Foster, one of the divers that I did a lot of diving with, who built camera systems before they were even available. And he keep meticulous logs, and by 1999, we had over 500 dives in. Wow, that is extraordinary. Now, were you the first dive team to document the the wreckage of the Tacoma Narrows? I believe there could very well have been others. However, okay. we took the time to build camera systems that were not available commercially at that time. We were taking... PVC pipes and building systems ourselves, flooding them, losing lots of money and starting <laughs> over. Our, our real interest came out of our love for spearfishing, ironically, and that was when we first started. And then uh, again into the historical significance of the bridge. And I kept working at that and working with the state, gathering the information. And it was just a perfect match of underwater video, which I believe was extremely high quality for 30 years ago. And it was done by people that were just starting out in the industry. And many of those went into the professional portion, building height, lights, and house, housings and camera systems. So it, uh, it just evolved. And uh, I was in Panama when Nancy Johnson called me and said, we're nominated for an ACE award. And I said, well, okay. What does that mean? Is that a poker game we're going to be playing at? Or, <laughs> and I found out what it was at that time. It was pretty, pretty excited about it. And then I was in Uruguay when the actual award came out. So Nancy accepted the award. And I played the role of uh, gathering the information, doing all the underwater scenes, um, the lighting, the, uh, arranging that. And of course, Municipal TV and their fabulous staff did all the research to talk to these different individuals that actually were there at the site when that bridge collapsed. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. Yeah. So, I thought everybody yeah. forgot. I thought everybody forgot about this. Quite frankly, <laughs> thirty years went by. I've never heard anything about it, and it's hard to find. It was in the public library, but it looks like that's all going to change now. 
Well, yeah. So I just reshared the the link in the comments down here. So if you guys haven't already seen the documentary, uh, that is going to live on our, our YouTube page. So you'll have the opportunity to go back and rewatch it. Uh, it's only like 30 minutes. It's a very concise mm -hmm. type piece, but really phenomenal. I think it does a phenomenal job, not just of, you know, telling more of the story of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, but then the underwater footage is breathtaking. Really? Yeah, it's really incredible. One it's, of the uh, things that, I, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, it's okay, go ahead. Well, I, one of the things that I thought was so interesting that the documentary really touched on that I feel like not a lot of people talk about is the long standing reputation of Galloping Gertie as a moving bridge. I think people assume that the nickname came from the one day where disaster just struck unawares, but the fact that people would come to ride on this undulating bridge and have that like roller coaster experience isn't something that you see people talk about very often. Yeah, so that really was a huge it. surprise for me when I first watched it. I couldn't believe that people were, of course, knowing that it, I guess they didn't think it would fall down, but that footage that's in the documentary of, you know, oh, this is today on Sunday, we're gonna have a great day. We're gonna go ride the bridge. I mean, and that I guess was safe. Uh, yeah, that's amazing. I agree, Chris. You had to be a thrill seeker to go across the bridge when that thing was undulating. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. Uh, when it first was built, it started almost immediately. They tried putting dampeners on each end of the bridge, um, many, many hundreds of tons of weights to hold down and try to stiffen it up, but it didn't work. A famous bank that now exists in, in Puget Sound, I, it's changed names, and I won't mention the name of it, but put a sign on the entry to Tacoma, and it said, your bank is as safe as the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. And of course, oh, no. they took that and that sign the next day. Mm, fair, 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 fair. Yeah, yeah. Everyone yeah. thought it was so safe. I thought that was so interesting too about um the insurance agent. Same thing. Yeah, he so, thought it was very safe. He kept pocketed all the premiums, and he went to jail <laughs> when the bridge fell and there was no money. And he actually spent time in McNeil Island, which you can see the bridge from McNeil Island. So. That must have been uh, a little bit of justice there. Uh, <laughs> just a constant reminder right there. Right. So I want to I wanna ask you a couple questions just as a, a personal fan of subaquatic adventures and then open it up to everyone. So anyone who's watching tonight, I really want you guys to feel free to ask questions because you have a plethora of knowledge at your fingertips right now. Uh, and we'll make sure that Robert gets those uh, questions and has the opportunity to answer them. But for me, something I've always been so intrigued by is the construction of the, the pillars, right? Mm -hmm. And so when they're showing it in the documentary of them just dumping pieces over the side to go down to these concrete pillars, they talk a lot about how the divers would be working blind down there, essentially, right? Correct. So yeah, the yeah, can you talk about that? <laughs> yeah, uh, you're you're actually inside a caisson, so you don't have the ambient light uh, in the water column. And naturally, as you're working inside the caisson, everything is stirring up. So it's what we called mud diving, and it's it takes a special person to drop a couple hundred feet underwater into that kind of condition, and then spend a reasonable amount of time working and come back out without losing your mind. Quite frankly. Or yeah, uh, there's a lot of people could get injured too because we were just discovered uh, the idea about bends from our caissons disease that is commonly caused called and that was in the construction of Golden Gate Bridge. They didn't understand why people were going down, working at this depth, and then coming back up and falling over crippled, and discovered that uh, there's there's re decompression recompression issues. Yeah, how long would a shift be down there? Do you know? Oh, well, a diving ship would probably be about 20 minutes okay. because they'd have to do, uh, they'd have a decompression chamber up on the surface and they would rush them in quickly. Uh, so it would be a massive amount of divers to get the job accomplished. They tried to get as much done without the divers as possible, but there was comments about rigging lights. And it was kind of not a good idea because the lights were high powered lights with electrical and you know, 1938, when they started, you really didn't have the best type of ground fault interrupters or things to protect yourself from being electrocuted. So the divers preferred to work just in the dark. Wild. And yeah. just, to, just to touch base with anyone who's tuning in right now, just assuming 
that you're coming in in the dark, like a like a caisson diver, let's say. Uh, we're, we're talking about the Tacoma Narrows Bridge right now, which of course uh, famously, I guess, shook itself apart on November 7th in 1940. And the wreckage of that first bridge fell down into the Narrows, which I think I've got a pretty decent photo. This is from the um, assessment for the historic registration bid. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, showed, I put that together. I'm the one that developed that. I, I was hoping that was the case because yes. I went through the documents and I was wondering if you were the one who was instrumental in that. So this yeah, is, we, I love this. Go ahead. We, we, uh, um, the, the, the big breakthrough to, to develop this type of uh, imagery and technology came by with side scan sonar. And I managed to get my hands on one in 1989 and was able to drug it through the area. And then that identifies all the locations of the roadbed, all of the construction blocks that were used for anchoring and any other parts and pieces that are recognizable. And I had to use that in showing to the, the council who would, for historic preservation to get this nominated to both the state, federal, city and county register of historical places. You have to remember the way it's set up, the council people would usually go to a building or a facility and look at it and identify the historical integrity. But aside from the, um, the Arizona and Hawaii, there's never been a submerged resource that was added without the, the, the people actually viewing it. So I had to go take video and show the people, convince them what the resource looked like and identify it so it could be added properly to the National Register. So we to... developed that in uh, 1990, no, 1989 is when that that uh, drawing was done. Now, did you take a great deal of like photographs in for this presentation as well, I'm assuming? Yes, yes, quite a few. That's where we started developing the video systems mm. that would, and the lighting systems because they're they're critical. And then, of course, Mother Nature always throws in what we call the religious experience. You go out there to dive, obviously, if I made that there 300 times before this documentary was made, uh, you come through all different types of currents, weather conditions, which affect water visibility. And there's those days when all the things are just right. You drop in the water. You've got 80 or 90 feet visibility. It's just clear as a bell. Wow. And we did have a number of those religious experiences, and we were able to get those recorded. We started off on high on eight, high eight um, HD Beta cam. Uh, we've gone through every gamut of recording medium as possible, and I always try to, on all my projects, to get the highest quality possible for reproduction. We actually have a question right on that vein right now, as to whether or not flashlights could be used, and what is the exact depth that you guys were diving at? Well, the the depths ranged, but generally they're speaking about a hundred feet to a hundred and fifty. Uh, roughly 200 feet is the deepest portion that's out in the center. Um, and we didn't make it out there too often because we're not using rebreathers. We're not using these trimix gases. We were using just straight air that you pump into a scuba tank. So it takes a, a little bit of craziness and a whole lot of uh, mental fortitude to keep <laughs> nitrogen narcosis from overcoming you. That um, is and, crazy, Bob. <laughs> well, yeah, I've, I've never been known to be crazy that my nickname was mad dog at the time <laughs> so the uh the lights we built our own lights ironically you'd ask because the lights that were available for divers were too small they're little flashlights we were putting out uh, gigantic bug lights that we were building in our garages so that we could get plenty of light because with light it helps your awareness when you're getting nitrogen narcosis you don't get paranoid you get well, you understand your surroundings. And then you can always look for those big, giant 30, 40, 50 pound link cod that you want to spear for the barbecue. <laughs> That's awesome. Hey, I just want to give a quick shout out. Uh, the person that asked that question, Smashing Beaker, is one of my students. So, hi, thank you for joining hey. us. Hey, yeah, thanks, look thanks, at that. Thanks, <laughs> thanks for the question. Uh, well, local historian uh, Karen Haas also has a question for us about whatever happened to the engineer who made them cut all those corners to save money or actually. I guess leave corners if you look at the engineering <laughs> bridge. Yeah, precise. <laughs> well, most of his, he uh, he passed away a few years after the failure of this bridge. He was very well known for bridge construction, and the the area where this was built it was unlike the other areas he'd built for bridges. And the harmonic resonation factor, in other words, the the girders he used, 
acted as a wing that actually caused lift. And as the bridge hit a certain speed and velocity, that lift would cause the decks to come up. Because you can see that's a suspension bridge. The real weight that it's bearing is all the cables that go up. And you see the cables that go down to both sides. Those cables, if you were to take each cable apart and put them end to end, they would stretch from Tacoma, Washington to Hong Kong and back. It's a tremendous amount of, of cable engineering wow. that went into it. Yeah, he, he, he was very absolutely distraught about it and uh, passed away, I think it was about two or three years after the event. He never really did much after that. Yeah, well, I can understand that that would be a difficult thing because wasn't he also under pressure? Like, my understanding was that his recommendation was to leave those flaps underneath the bridge open so that air could pass through them more effectively and to cut cost, you sort of encouraged to close them, which was a big part of that lift. Unfortunately, even today in our world, uh, all these big constructions, they're all related to cost. Mm -hmm. If somebody come in and convince you they're building something, a better widget for 25% less, normally municipality and stuff will take the opportunity to take a chance and away they go. Um, once again, his designs were consistent with the East Coast bridges that he designed. And he designed many and built a number of them. But out in Puget Sound, where we're at, and the unique nature of the Narrows, it didn't fit any of the criteria or any of the other options that he even had to work with before. Yeah, if he had simply opened up the slides, the sides a little bit more, that would have stopped this harmonic resonation. But it was just the combination of how much air came in, funneled in, which just like a vortex gives more lift to that right. deck. So if they'd actually cut the sides open more, it would have survived probably. We've got a, I don't know if this is necessarily a question, but certainly a comment. We've got someone who actually took the uh, scuba instructor course with you in the 1970s, so. Oh boy. Just want to give you a, a quick shout out. There are people connected to you in the audience today. <laughs> I I can imagine. Uh, I don't know who that might be, but uh, good good to hear from you. I'm glad you're still around and your uh, many tide changes since then. And uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, that was a Patty instructor, uh, instructor number eight zero two nine, which I think they're up to about one hundred and fifty thousand or something now. So it's a long time ago. Jeez. Yeah, who who is it? Can you tell me who it was? Uh, Carolyn Marie Bruno Yabui. Okay. Which I'm sure that I. Oh, Carolyn. Okay. Hello, Carolyn. <laughs> Hi, Carolyn. <laughs> so we got a question about the cost to build the original bridge. And I feel like I knew this answer once. Hmm. Julia, that might be for you. Oh, for I me? I think it's for Bob. Bob, you know, how much did it cost? Six million dollars. Oh, okay. Go. There you go. And yeah, but it's considerably it. more. And it's interesting too because when the bridge fell, we were in the middle of the wars. And so mm -hmm. they didn't get a chance really to get the medals that they needed to finish the bridge until 1950. And of course, uh -huh. uh, the 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 person who lost their car, their dog, and the, the contents were paid about eight hundred dollars because of the loss. And today, I think we figured it up, Julie, it was $14,000. So money yeah. changes quite a bit. Six million mm -hmm. then is a lot of money. And as you know, it just keeps uh, escalating. And with the new bridge, um, it's a lot, of, a lot of money. It's a lot of money. Oh, so here we have a great question that's that I actually question. want to talk about too. So how much of the debris that's at the bottom of the, uh, the narrow stretch under the two new bridges is original? And what happened to a lot of it? Well, um, one of the reasons that I was wanting to put this, the bridge the remains on the National Register is to give it some protection against um, scrappers coming along and taking parts of the bridge and pillowing up for steel because it creates a, a, an economic, um, historical, and, uh, and a place for entertainment where people go and fish. It was well known to, to be a great fishing spot. So um, my efforts were to protect it. And it got protection. But when the new bridge was built, the contractors that built uh, drug cables and chains that are about 100 pounds or better per link to anchor the caissons, just similar in design of construction from the original bridge. So there's a good picture right there on a, 
And uh, they drug those as a tide change, they move, and they're just, they'll cut a ship right in half. That's the way in the Panama Canal, they, if a ship sinks, they have a special vessel that goes and runs these chains, and they just saw the, the vessel in half and remove it. So the historical integrity is gone. Hmm. Um, it's just been, uh, it, you, if you looked at that first drawing, you can definitely make roadbed out. You can see from the picture of the actual collapse and relate to that picture, a drawing of where all the fart parts are, and those are gone. They're they're not there anymore. They're been drug over to the side and destroyed. So one of the important things about that documentary is we were actually able to capture the actual place where the bridge rested as it broke the surface on that date and landed on the bottom. The bridge between the two pilings is what was lost. They recovered the bridge from the pilings to the shore and used that. Mm -hmm. Actually, had, they had scrapped it to for the war effort. And they kept the pilings, the big pilings, and constructed a wider bridge. And and it took till 1950 to get that done. So the historical integrity is gone. The material is still there, not in, and there's no historical integrity to it at all. You just see a bunch of barnacles, covered steel girders. There's nothing that would be like it was when we were diving it. There were places we would swim into where the roadbed had fallen and laid over these concrete blocks with our anchors. So you could swim underneath the roadbed. It's just loaded with sea life. Wow. Um, and it, that's all gone. We I had some pet names I called the areas which kind of caught on. The, the, the arena is one. A good uh, diving partner of mine, Kim Hill, back then, we used to go out there and shoot the biggest darn link out you've ever seen out of this place. And uh, we, uh, uh, there was always fish there. The schools of black bass were so thick, you could take a spear gun and shoot into the school and get two on your spear at one time. Just prolific in fish. That's actually a perfect lead in to this question about some of your most interesting encounters with critters under the sea. This should be good. I'm super oh, wow. excited for this one. Oh, wow. Uh, well, <laughs> my goodness. Uh, well, we found a very uh, a salmon shark right at the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, which brought up it had died and took it over to the aquarium. And they made a display of it trying to get students to identify which shark this is. It's a really unique look to it. Um, I've encountered some things which I have no, absolutely no idea what we were looking at or what ran into us. I've been bit pretty good on the hand by sea life. I carry some scars, some scratches. Um, uh, gosh, it's, it never ceases to amaze me when we take these trips down thousands of feet in the water. I keep waiting to find some species that's really big, bad, and ugly, and I'm going to call it Bob Mesterunus something or other. <laughs> name it after myself. But so far, I haven't found nothing bad enough to name. Uh, you know, we're just now starting to find things that we thought was impossible to exist. Because now we're exploring the deepest parts of the ocean, 35, 38,000 feet of water, the Marias Trench. They thought it would be void of life, and quite the contrary, it's not. There's a big movement toward the oceans, and it's actually a race, and we're not at the head of that race. <laughs> There's other countries in the world that are far ahead of us, and we need to, we need to <clears throat> catch up. The, but to go back to the question, what is one of the more memorable events. I was or, diving on. I'm sorry, go ahead. ahead. We I was also diving on the most exotic too. Oh, exotic. Uh, one of the most interesting, I was diving on a wreck off Port Townsend uh, over off of and uh, where they have all the munitions stored on the island right off of uh, Port Townsend. Heavy fog. We drove out to there and I, there was a barge that was laying on this the Alaskan reefer, it's called, a wreck that was lost. They used this old barge to salvage it. And I thought we'd come up on the barge. So I jumped in the water and swam over to it. It was a gray whale. I was, had my plane, my hands on everything, and suddenly it kind of came alive. And uh, it didn't hurt me in any way, shape, or form. Uh, in the southern sound, Walt Amadon, I hope Walt's listening, a good old dive friend of mine. Uh, in Taylor Bay, we were, we were in a school of killer whales. And I had my 35 millimeter camera with me and took pictures, underwater pictures. And I sent them to Washington State. And then that was the pictures that started the whole program for identifying killer whales by the, uh, the shape of the fins and the pattern of the saddle in the white. Wow. Uh, yeah. So um, uh, other events. Uh, 
Gosh, Every time um, I talk to you, Bob, you come up with some other amazing fact. <laughs> I, I, could, I forgot I've more things I remember. Uh, we were diving on a B-17 in the Ashawana waterway up in Labrador. And uh, about a 36-pound northern pike decided that was her home. And she challenged us quite a bit. Uh, and I don't know if you've seen a pike, but they were nothing but teeth. They're like a barracuda, freshwater barracuda. We ended up having one of the guides catch it. We ate the thing, and it was delicious. And we eliminated the threat. Uh, we had a shark down in uh, Panama that caused some problems that we had to take out, unfortunately. Don't um, challenge Bob underwater. Bob, can you see the questions that Chris is putting up on the screen there for you? Oh, I see that. Okay, Robin. How large are the octopus under the bridge? Well, Jacques Cousteau came up and looked for a bunch of octopus, and they couldn't find any. So I got a call, and I took them out to a couple locations and places. Um, I've, we found one out of Tacoma Narrows. They had contests there where they were octopus hunt off of Titlow Beach, and they would pull them up 12, 14 feet, tip to tip. Uh, so the, the, some of the largest in the world exist there. But they also exist out in the bay. And I did run into one octopus, and I've caught many octopus, and I've been around many large ones, and they're very timid. But I ran into one that was too big for me to mess with. It actually <laughs> was a little aggressive. I think it was probably close to 20 feet in length, tip to tip. And no, uh, <laughs> it, uh, it looked like I, it was upset. I don't know. Maybe it was eating, breeding or something. But uh, I, I, I actually, it's the only time I was ever concerned about an octopus. Remind I me did. not to go diving with you, Bob. <laughs> it sounds like the exact guy I want to go diving with. <laughs> okay. Okay. You go. Robert, are you about familiar it with the, uh, the story of... Uh, the uh, the Puget Sound Commencement Bay sea monster at all? Well, I don't dive anymore, so I know it's not me. I don't know really what you're <laughs> talking this, about. Um, in 1893, there was a uh, group of men who were camping on the beach, sort of near where Point Defiance is today, and mm -hmm. they recounted seeing a serpent come out of the water shooting electricity from its like nose flares. And then in the 1960s, this story got retold and published in the local newspaper. I actually have a picture of this sea monster. Oh, uh, really? This was. Oh, that's this lovely. is from hmm. the News Tribune in the 1960s, based on the historic account they have from 1893 of this multi-eyed, copper-banded, electricity-shooting sea monster. Hmm. I didn't know if that was I, something you were familiar with. You know, I think I remember the story. And there's a bar on the beach right near there that's still there. I think that maybe that's where the monster originated. <laughs> uh, I've never, I've never heard of a, a, a copper banded uh, such a creature, but I have been on a dive where something came up behind us that was very glowing. That uh, made a short visit and then left, and it was pretty unexplainable. Um, the ocean is full of things we don't know yet, and species are dying today at an enormous rate because of our environment. So in 1918, 1700s, I'm sure there were things out in the ocean that were common that are now extinct because of what's changed in our oceans. Mm -hmm. um, and when they go further into this, the oceans, the greater depths, they're finding things that are just amazing. Uh, I, I can't begin to tell you that Jacques always thought the first hundred feet were all life existed. Well, that's not true. The whole water column to the deepest part of the ocean is full of fish. And we just need to be a little bit more careful on how we treat the ocean because once they're gone, we're mm. going to have a rough time. You won't be having shrimp on the Barbie. Nobody <laughs> wants that. Well, let's see if we've got some additional questions for you here. And... This is everyone's opportunity to to ask whatever questions. You've got uh, a great deal of knowledge from Mr. Mester here. Let's see. Yeah, it's very Lessons likely hurt. that LSD okay. was responsible for that. <laughs> um, yeah. I have a question for you briefly, sure. sort of to uh, tease what's coming up here in December for our next Foss Water Seaport tour. Right. Are there Hi. any... <laughs> Are there any really famous shipwrecks in Commencement Bay that you think you might know something about? Well, we've talked about this. Uh, uh, there are a number of shipwrecks known, they, and the city of Kingston's one, and of course the Andalena is another. Andalena was the largest loss of life in the year 
where the boat capsized and it's a steel hull iron hull actually vessel that uh, was tried to be salvaged and uh, everybody around that ship lost their lives even the diver that was trying to, to, to self salvage it um, and the the conditions in commencement bay are such that there are many many ships that have gone down that will never know the name of because they just were forgotten in history and the conditions in the bottom at commencement bay are such that uh, the the silt and the seismic activity we had and the combination, the texture of that silt from Mount Rainier or Mount Rainier and deforestation and mixing of all that material makes it for an unlikelihood of, of being able to see many of those wrecks. They're going to be very, very deep in the silt. We recovered an anchor that goes back to 1860s right out the mouth, right, right next to the museum. In fact, it's very, very close. And it was on a slope and it had been covered for sure because the, uh, the oak stock, English oak, which is about this big in diameter, um, was still intact and it just exposed. Incredible. You could see the slope. And uh, we brought that up and uh, the Dimmer Family Foundation funded the restoration and it's up at the uh, Washington State Historical Society Museum on the second floor when you go out the elevator. It's there and it's glory and probably be there forever because it's too damn big to move around. <laughs> <laughs> I love this question. Do you have a Oh, go ahead, Julia. <laughs> oh, yeah. Bob, did you see that? Do you have a book? And we want you to write the book, The Internet Has Spoken, and also narrate the audio tour yourself. I'm not mm -hmm. sure if you can see all the comments coming in about what a great storyteller you mm -hmm. are. And I agree. We're waiting. The world is well, waiting. <laughs> my mother always said the best asset I had was my mouth. Uh, <laughs> however, I, I have ironically through all the experiences I've been through and they've been many, 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 I've been very fortunate. Uh, I document and I take the highest quality of video or medium to record. And I guess I'm destined to probably put some things together. I have talked to some famous authors that you all would know about some technical specs for their books that everybody's read. I'm sure. Like who? And, <laughs> no. I, 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 Really, Name unfortunately, I can't. I can't. Uh, oh, I'm you can't. Contract. We're just having no, to think. Hmm. I could. Do but he's not alive right now. But his son's doing some books, so oh. um, <laughs> it's uh, there. Uh, yeah, I, I think someday I will. I did co-author or co-publish a book with a Mr. Doug Champlin uh, when we were in Russia, but it was of Russian weapons confiscated during World War II and World War One. It's a neat looking book, but it really didn't go very far. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been very lucky that Bob's been sharing a lot of videos with us at the seaport. And I get to be here working from home late at night, watching Bob's video and going, Bob, what is this? This is incredible. So we, the documentary that you can see online has not been seen publicly since it came out on Tacoma TV in 1990. So that's what we're talking about today, if you're just joining us. And we've put the link in the chat and it's linked to anywhere that you would be watching the stream to go ahead and go watch that. And Bob does narrate some of that, I believe, right, Bob? So That's you can, for your fans, for his That's fans, correct. you can go there. And we're going to be do, doing a lot more with Bob, especially um, about the wreck of the Andalena next month, where we have some series and more interviews coming up about that. I see a bunch more uh, questions coming in, Chris. Yeah, I've got, this is the one that I really want Bob mm -hmm. to talk about briefly. Is the car still located with the bridge wreckage? Well, I don't think it, once it left the air, once it fell and the roadway fell from it, it's probably lost its connection with the bridge right there. And um, talking to Julie, and we might put together a little plan for people, young people, to take a look at a question that I've had for years. And where is the car? Uh, it's, a, it's a little bit of a physics. There's weather. And the car didn't disappear, but it's light enough with the current, the way it was moving in the wind, it would travel some distance. So I'm not gonna give any hints out, but you have to figure out which way the current was moving, which way the wind was going. Let's take a look at the dimensions of the car, figure out some kind of flotation. Uh, there are algorithms for this that have been built. I've had some involvement in those for location of uh, lost people in the water or vehicles or jettison cargoes. So you can actually, we can go back and recreate that period and kind of get an idea where that car might be. It's not going to look like a car because of the 
massive amount of current that goes through there. You'll find the, the frame, probably the rear end, the engine, transmission. But nobody's ever found the car. And that's something we've talked about at that depth. We have at the seaport um, a like you know a drone in the sky. We have one that goes underwater. So we're talking about kind of a robot drone mission, maybe with some students next year trying to identify where it might be and then searching for it with the drone. Right. So the task would be to come up with an X that marks a spot. And I might add, on all my years of experience, X never marks the spot. <laughs> it's never marked. The spot. <laughs> never. So, <laughs> but yeah, we could try. Maybe, see, I, maybe, maybe <laughs> things will change. I would love to find somebody put an X next to That's <laughs> weird. <laughs> Just in case, if somehow you're not familiar with what we're talking about briefly, there was only one fatality from the destruction of the Narrows Bridge, and it was a three legged spaniel named Tubby, who in uh, Tubby's fear refused to leave the vehicle, despite I believe three different people went to recover the dog uh, and Tubby bit one of them. And so remained in the vehicle as it was flung from the bridge and lost at sea, unfortunately. Right, and the dog's name was Tabby. Was it but, Tabby? Uh, Tabby, yeah, that, that's wow. what I was told, but um, yeah, but that's, uh, you know, potato, potato, I, I'm not sure. But, potato, potato. Uh, 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 the, the, that's the, the person that lost the dog put in for uh, his car and, I, if you you have to take a close look at the undulation of that bridge and that car, the dog was just probably scared out of his mind. It had one leg missing and it was it had some problems, so it was just uh, you're not going to get it to cooperate with any any way of getting out of that car. It was going to stay there and it did till it died. But there are two people that I'm aware of. A third tried, but the one person that got in and actually got bit on his way back, the bridge would drop 20 feet underneath it. It would undulate. He would fall 20 feet, but his knees pretty bad. Uh, I mean, it was it was violent. And anybody in the world that knows anything about engineering knows the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. It's a classic <laughs> example of harmonic resonation. And Absolutely. everyone studies it. I, I that footage in the documentary, sorry, that footage mm. in the documentary of him running off the bridge as it's collapsing beneath his feet, that was incredible. We were watching it, the staff in the back, and we're all going, what? <laughs> I've never seen this. Do you want to well, talk a little bit about some of that footage? It seems like you had some really unique stuff that went into that documentary. Yeah, we were able to find a lot of footage that um, was lost or overlooked in many little reservoirs of information here in the state. Tacoma Library is one, but also down in Olympia. And um, there were also the two individuals that had the, the most famous reels of pictures that were taken, but there was others on the side uh, in the little park on the east side that actually was there and you could hear, they had sound and you could hear the cable snapping and this sounds like gunshots going off. And these cables, you realize they're, you know, 12, 14 inches in diameter and they're snapping. Well, there's a lot of dangerous material that was flying around. It was very, very violent. And um, Tacoma Tree TV, um, Nancy Johnson and her staff did a wonderful job of collecting all the material and putting it together. So the story flowed, how it got built, what it looked like, the event, and then its failure and then what's happened since the failure because even though the bridge failed it is absolutely a part of Tacoma's history and really that, phenomenal stuff I just my, love that underwater footage where that's a uh, Bob Foster right there and we're swimming along the wreckage right underneath the west piling and there's a shot coming up in a minute that is one of my favorite where I look down through the roadbed and he's down maybe 12, 14 feet and his bubbles are coming up uh, into my camera lens. And the visibility was just wonderful. Um, and you realize that it, it, at that depth, 130, 140 feet, pretty, pretty common, those dives. Uh, I think the west piling was 120 and the east piling was 130, 35. And uh, you don't have a lot of time and you just have to be very careful because you can get tangled. You can see all the different pieces of metals, jacket. You can get down and, and get inside and start exploring. And you can, you, you have to be careful. And we all looked out for each other. And, you know, 30, 30 years later, we're still here, still talking. 
Well, we'll do one final uh, sweep of questions here, but uh, Robert, I really appreciate you joining us tonight and making sure that your your mission and your message is still getting out there because this documentary is in every way deserving of the ACE Award. And I think personally beyond that. So I'm glad that it's getting an opportunity to reemerge from the depths of the Narrows. Well, I, I appreciate you resurrecting it because as Julie will tell you, it wasn't hard to, it wasn't easy to get. We, uh, well, there wasn't many copies available and the people that did it were moved on. And I moved on to many other projects, many other countries. And uh, how strong were the winds the day it collapsed? You know, that's a real good question, I know, but why don't you take a look at it? Why don't you get the answer? And maybe you can help compute that where the car may have gone. <laughs> I'm trying to remember. I think it was uh, 35. It was not. under, it was a little over, it was right at about 40 miles an hour. But they believe that 37 knots was the harmonic resonation speed of wind that caused the lift. And the, when more wind came in, then that enhanced it. And it was pretty, pretty windy day. It was, I think it was close to 40 knots. Um, I, I, I have some records here, but the Tacoma Narrows Bridge is one of probably a couple hundred projects that I've done. And I have to refresh myself on all the figures because there's a lot to remember about Tacoma Narrows Bridge. It was a big event. Absolutely. And I can answer that question from Smashing Beaker. What time did the Narrows Bridge completely collapse? Because I just looked it up for the 80th anniversary and it was at 1107, right? Isn't that right, Chris? Because we did the 80th anniversary broadcast at 1130 that day, uh, November 7th. So Which is, we, yeah, I, I know that weirdly. <laughs> that 1107 on November 7th. Yeah. The it should happen. <laughs> Um, and yeah, if you're looking where you can find the documentary, it is current. I just put the um, address back into the comment section here. It's up on the Pretty Gritty Tours YouTube page. <clears throat> and I believe, is it on the FOSS Seaport? It is, yeah. Uh, yeah. No, oh, I think no. it's just on yours. Okay. We'll get um, it up on ours eventually. And hey, I want to mention, you guys, that Chris is doing this completely as a volunteer. So please tip your tour guide. He will put a link in there um, so that you can do that. But he is doing this just out of the goodness of his heart for us. And we really, really appreciate it. I appreciate all the guests. And, you know, Chris is just really passionate about history. And we're so lucky to have him as a partner. And it's so great also to have Bob as well. So we're just we're really lucky over at the Seaport. And we, we appreciate everyone. <laughs> Well, I just appreciate the opportunity to hang out with cool people and share some sweet history of the area. Sweet stories. I'm Which? just glad I'm still alive to talk about it. <laughs> we are so, too. Uh, it's really you're, good you're that it, it became adventures. Yeah. It's really good that it's, it resurfaced, kind of a little bit of a pun there. But uh, I want to make sure that everyone knows on that documentary, there were many other people that I spent many years diving with that were part of that project. We have a tendency to put a name on something and don't realize that there are other people involved in it. And I wouldn't even begin to start mentioning all the names, but it looks like we may do an update to this. And if we do, I was talking to one of the divers who has a lot of raw footage, will probably make their names known to everybody. Well, that would awesome. be fantastic. Bob Foster is one of them. Bob Foster's one of them. Good yes. to know. Good to know. Still, still diving. Still diving the area. Perfect. And I should mention, too, there's another documentary that we debuted on November 7th on the 80th anniversary, which you might have heard about, called 700 Feet Down, which has a little bit different take. Um, and that one, they it, it's, we're going to re-debut that for a couple of days, but that one's really new, and they're turning it into film festivals and things. So we've gotten a lot of questions on if that one's also available for release, and it's not quite yet. You might see it if you watch pop up back on the website for another 24 hours, maybe over Thanksgiving. Um, and then you have have just so much, you know, with the anniversary, it's been so great to get all this information coming back about the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. So I just want to say thank you to both you and the producers of 700 Feet Down for letting us debut your documentaries. And I keep, keep diving. Everybody <laughs> keep diving out there. Keep diving. Keep swimming. Right, right. You know, well, Robert, the, uh, do you have anything you want to say in closing? No, just that I, I appreciate the opportunity to bring this back again to the surface and your involvement. And I look forward to working with both of you on continuing more historical information about 
the, their local area here, maybe go out a little bit further and help explain a little bit how our world works and through eyes of someone that's seen it for 70 years and it changes. Well, I deeply appreciate that. Okay. I think um, the last thing I'll say, because you've been very uh, pragmatic and coy about this whole thing, but our next big seaport uh, third Thursday tour is going to be really discussing the history of uh, the Andalena, its voyage around the world, and then its eventual cursed sinking <laughs> here in the Tacoma uh, Commencement Bay area and the lives that it's taken with it. I am unequivocal in my belief that it is cursed. Uh, the I'm behavior so of the people on board have haunted oh it. God. And it remains at the bottom because of very bad behavior. But could you confirm for me really quick, based on the, the silt and the, just the, I guess, geology of the area, could there still be organic matter, like the skeletal remains preserved Absolutely. inside the ship? Yeah, wow. absolutely. absolutely. There's, there's no doubt about it. Uh, and it's if it was on the surface or exposed above the bottom, uh, there wouldn't be any chance of that. But uh, submerged that way, and a remarkable actually preservation when those those type of environments. Yeah, and that's, that's right. actually how I met Bob is on my search for the Andalena. So I'm really excited to talk about that and all the things that we found. So it's not totally cursed. It brought us Bob. <laughs> that's that's true. <laughs> Maybe curse after all, you don't know. <laughs> well, oh, come on now. <laughs> thank you both for uh, joining us tonight. I'm looking forward to our future adventures. And to everyone tuned in tonight, thank you guys so much for joining us. If you have additional questions, leave them in the comments. We'll make sure that Robert gets them uh, and has an opportunity to address them with his vast expertise. But until then, I'm uh, Chris Stottinger with Pretty Gritty Tours, encouraging you guys to keep on exploring.